Entrando em contato com atendimento ao cliente. Para muitas pessoas é um jeito fácil de arruinar um bom dia. Mas na Zendesk, nós deixamos a experiência do cliente melhor. Melhor para sua avó, melhor para o seu vendedor preferido de flores, melhor para o cara do apartamento 3A, melhor para você, melhor para todos. Porque enquanto alguns dizem que o cliente sempre tem razão, nós dizemos que o cliente é sempre humano. E como seres humanos, queremos fazer algo melhor para todos nós. Zendesk, experiência do cliente com IA desenvolvida para humanos. Você que está ouvindo o seu podcast e curte fazer um bom negócio, vai aí uma dica imperdível. A nova Chevrolet S10 está na sua melhor versão, bruta e macia ao mesmo tempo. De um lado, toda a força e potência de uma picape bruta, invocada e conectada. Do outro, todo o conforto que só a nova suspensão proporciona. Muito mais macia e silenciosa, deixando suas viagens ainda mais confortáveis. É a nova S10 que você conhece e confia ainda mais bruta brutalmente macia. Acesse chevrolet.com.br para saber mais. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode and I have Shannon, the anti-hustle business coach. She is a business entrepreneur and she's been able to achieve uh, life, time and location freedom living in Italy and uh, she's got a fantastic story and I'm really happy to have her on the show. So Shannon, uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's a 20 to 25 minute fireside conversation. So talk about your journey. It looks like you've been to the Cayman Islands and um, mm -hmm. it looks like you do a lot of uh, very fascinating things and uh, enlighten us for the audience. Yeah, so I lived in Seattle. I was there for about, I think, 12 years and had gotten caught up in the club scene and was drinking and using and I just needed a complete change of my life. And so... I had an opportunity to move to the Cayman Islands in 2013 uh, and just live with a friend and get a job there. And so I moved there and then six months later I got sober. And so then that was the beginning of my personal development journey. And so got really into fitness and yoga and went through yoga teacher training and thought, oh, I could be a coach on the side and do yoga teacher training. Um, and then I shattered my wrist. So that knocked yoga out of the equation. And so I went to coach training and uh, started that in 2015. And that's when I started my business. And it just kind of took off from there. My goal was to really help women live big, bold, beautiful lives bravely. Uh, and so I started doing that and I didn't realize that I was really good at like the business and marketing stuff. And so um, kind of weaved my way through, but I still get to do that because I get to help my clients build businesses and make money and move to new countries and uh, live unapologetically. So I essentially do what I uh, put out to do in 2015. So I moved to Italy in 2017 um, and that's where I've been ever since. Yeah, it's a really fascinating journey, and um, you know, it sounds like you had a lot of uh, life experiences and can in the universe kind of directing you to what you're doing. And so, um, mm -hmm. one thing that uh, is quite interesting is when you say live unapologetically. You know, for the audience, they a lot of them still have jobs or, or whatnot or careers. So, um, kind of enlighten us. What are the core tenets of living unapologetically? Good question. Well, deeply learning, like knowing who you are. Um, you know, one of the things that we do in terms of business is really looking at your vision and your values and what do you stand for? Um, what don't you stand for? And then learning how to talk about that, set boundaries, take care of yourself. A big thing with um, women, especially moms too, is that they put everybody's needs first and they put their needs on the back burner. And so um, really learning how to unapologetically take care of themselves and advocate for themselves. And yeah, just my business is built on storytelling. And so one of the things that I work with all my clients is how to share their story to build their brand and to attract their ideal customers. And so in order to do that, to have an online business, you have to really um, work through a lot of your own messaging, the good girl conditioning, being too much, not enough, body image stuff. Um, there's just so much that you have to work through in order to 
be able to show up and and take up space in the world really yeah it's interesting because i've heard um uh create space and take up space especially in the um the kind of the spiritual um scene and um the other question i have for you is um you know we have this idea of um you know we have to hustle 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 make money and another day another dollar um but then you have this uh business school called the anti-hustle business school so how do you how do you reconcile those two mm-hmm. yeah i mean this is like baked into our culture right just like you have to you have to show up for your job monday through friday this is how it used to be anyway now i know we're working way more than that but monday through friday 40 hours a week right someone's breathing down your neck you can never take a break you always have to look busy be busy right And so one thing that I noticed when my clients were moving into entrepreneurship was that now they had 40 hours, (laughs) like what are you supposed to do with 40 hours extra? And so what they were doing was they were filling those 40 hours, like if they've left their job and now they're just focusing on their business, they're doing lots of just random busy stuff that's not actually getting them hired. Um, They're tinkering around in Canva, they're messing around with their uh, website over and over and over again, but they're not actually building their community there. Um, and so they're starting to replicate the same corporate mindset, hustle mindset that they were trying to get away from into their business. I see it time and time again. And so the focus of anti-hustle business school is really breaking down and the checklist. I have an anti-hustle business checklist. And what that does is it really breaks down the core foundational pieces that you need to have in your business. So I work primarily with coaches, consultants, and service providers. So those I've worked with accountants, photographers, salon owners, therapists, right? And the the main focus of Anti-Hustle Business School is to help them build a solid foundation. Some people even have to go back, like they've started their business, they've been hustling, and they're like, this is not working. So what to focus on? So teaching them how to create packages where they are charging for the package and the transformation, but not the hour, because that's how you get into hustle mode where it's like, well, dollars for hours and there's only so many hours in a day, right? How to launch, how to price things so that you're actually meeting your financial goals, but how to do it from a place of ease and pleasure and fun Um, looking at your schedule, what do you want your business to look like? Because you get to make the rules, right? Like nobody, nobody has rules for us. And so that gets really overwhelming for a lot of people. And so what we focus on is how to just calm that overwhelm. Here are the must haves. You must have a community. You must have a solid offer. You must have a way to get paid, right? And then the nice to have. So eventually you're going to need branding. Eventually you'll need a a sales page. And eventually you'll need a website and stuff. People, I mean, marketers are marketers for a reason. And so they're marketing the things that they're getting kickbacks on, like websites and lead pages and all of that. And so the new entrepreneur, the new coach thinks, oh, I have to have all of these things, lots of money going out. And it's just not true. So I'm here to just shake all that up, (laughs) give my clients the main things to focus on so that they can just go out and start making money and then worry about the website and all that other stuff later. It kind of reminds me of this, uh, the book, um, The E-Myth and where he he talks about um, working on the business versus working in the business and mm-hmm. um the other uh yeah it's quite interesting because i like this um i like how you really uh focus on things that move the needle forward and so um what are some key mindsets um for uh coaches and business owners that you help um that helped you succeed and help your clients succeed the first thing that comes to mind is that i get to have this that it's not just something that other people get to do that um, everybody else is getting hired, everybody else, because we, one thing that we all do is we start to really personalize the things, especially if you're building a business where, uh, like for coaches, if you are maybe like a divorce coach or, um, 
a relationship coach. You're a coach for a reason. It's because you've been through those things. And so now your business is very personal. And so there's a lot of feelings that are involved versus having more of a strategy. And so we start to get in our feelings about, oh, everybody else gets to have this but me, or this is going to take forever, or so-and-so looks like they're doing really well. And, you know, nobody likes me. So we have to really learn how to calm our nervous systems through somatic practices and tools. Emotional regulation is just like a huge part of the work that I do that we're we're not really taught how to do that. Um, we're not given the tools of how to calm, like notice when you're activated, notice where is it coming in your body? Like what are some practices that we can do to calm the activation? Um, and so that is, that's like a huge part of the work that I do as well as building in the trust and safety. I trust myself. So I'm really big on journal practices and, um, you know, journaling, um, and, and mindset work, but just really building in, I trust myself. I trust that I can handle this. I trust that I'm on the right path. I trust that if I can't figure it out, I can, I can find somebody to help me. It's safe for me to show up online. It's safe for me to charge these higher prices. It's safe for me to sell on social media because these are two huge, huge pieces that really derail a lot of people. Um, and until you just really start to bake this into your body, not just like, not just writing it out, like it's safe, right? You know, when you were a kid and it's like, I will not talk in class. I will not talk in class. It starts just to become really depersonal, or unpersonal. Um, and so when you can do the somatic practices that bring that safety into your body, that's when things really start to change. Yeah, I love how you describe emotional regulation and kind of um, there's this um, there's this new term that I've recently come across. It's nervous system dysregulation and um, mm. how stress and you know living, you know, you, we'll talk about digital nomad, but um, you know how living in the Western world really um, revs up your nervous system. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, what's, what is really interesting is, um, so there's this idea of a uh, trauma and, um, you, you obviously, um, you know, a lot of people, they turn to, um, you know, alcohol or drugs or sex or, um, gambling, um, you know, food. How does this, what, what, what role does trauma play in these addictions and how do, how do, um, entrepreneurs address their traumas to, um, heal those the kind of the symptoms of that trauma you know whether it's alcohol or food or whatnot mm -hmm. you know how they say like i mean these are just my thoughts on this but you know when they say that like oh cigarettes are the gateway drug or like marijuana is the gateway drug what i've heard so gabor mate is um a leading you know expert on addiction and and emotional wellness he talks about how trauma Trauma is actually the because your brain is changed during trauma. And so you you don't you just don't relate to people or things in the same way once that especially if like, you know, my trauma was ongoing, it was consistent, um, there was abuse in the home. And um, so it wasn't just like one instance, like it was a big T trauma, right? For many, many years. Um, and so my coping mechanisms, whether I knew it or not, were to use drugs and alcohol. And so that worked for many years until it wasn't working anymore. And then it was just like compounding problems and stress. And so, yeah, I mean, this stuff comes up, right? Like, I feel like so many coaches um, who have worked through this, then this becomes their work that I want to help people who went through some sim similar things. I wish that this was available to me when I was going through this. I wish that somebody like me existed or I wish somebody, right? Like this is what clients are saying. Like, I wish that somebody who did the service that I did was available back then because it would have changed my life. It would have sped up the process. It would have made things easier. I would have felt less alone. Um, and so that's, I feel like that kind of also alchemy alchemizes the experience and it makes it so that it was 
it wasn't for nothing, right? Like I can use these horrible things that happened to me as a way to help people feel seen, help people feel less alone and heard and understood. And then they can heal from their trauma. And now we start to clean things up, right? And then the trickle, trickle down effect of the work that we do just really starts to spread out exponentially. We'll never know the impact of our work, really. Yeah, that's really um, interesting um, because, you know, we talk about coping mechanisms and, um, you know, some of them can be, they can cause a lot of problems in relationships or finances, your health. Um, What about like coping mechanisms against childhood trauma that, um, that, for example, like, you know, I have a client that, you know, she you know, she grew up with nothing. So her coping mechanism was to make as much so that she can feel financially secure. And in a way that's good, but it's also what what about like those behaviors, you know, achievement and status and validation and these kind of things that, you know, uh, the dark side of that. What about those types of coping behaviors and mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like something maybe similar was when I was getting sober, I didn't go through 12 steps. I didn't go through a program or anything. Um, And so I needed to find something to keep me busy because I wasn't going out anymore. Um, And I mean, the Cayman Islands is like a big party. Like if you think, oh, I'm going on vacation, I'm going to have drinks. Like that was just basically your life. Um, And so I had a lot of free time. And so that's when I got into fitness. And then it turned into... Uh, I was obsessive about my macros. I was working out sometimes twice a day, like I was doing two a days, or I was doing, you know, two yoga classes and a three hour lifting. So I took this negative thing that I was trying to get away from to this like really positive thing, right? And then made it negative. <laughs> And then totally screwed myself up, screwed my metabolism up, right? And became obsessive. And I had the best body I've ever had, but my mental health was just trash. Like the reason behind it was trash. And so then as the years went on and now I'm back in the gym and I'm back in fitness, but then I had to completely rewire my relationship to fitness, to food, to macros, to counting all of that. And, you know, we do what we have to do to cope and to get through the moments. And then sometimes those, co- we, if you're prone to addiction, you're probably going to overdo something. <laughs> so of course I overdid exercise because I wasn't overdoing it at the bar. But then once the pendulum swings over, then hopefully it swings back, right? With support and just really understanding, oh, okay, maybe I've gone a little too far with this. I should uh, calm down and <laughs> have a better, healthier relationship with my body. <laughs> Be more kind because it it's both unkind, right? Like if you're putting substances, but then if you're like overworking and, you know, injuring yourself and that can also be unkind and not allowing yourself to have certain foods or that. So, you know, we want to be nicer to ourselves. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of, um, the place where it's coming from so you could have for example um like um you know i I have clients uh so for example you know the same client you know they put in a lot of hours they put in a lot of work and um you know to achieve business or you know whatever could be financial physical success emotional success and then but you can like this there's this underlying vibe from them that you you feel it's kind of like this need is this kind of like Mm -hmm. negative this urgency Whereas the same behavior, the different person coming from a uh, more uh, higher state vi- vibration, um, the, you won't see them struggle as much and you'll see them have more results. Whereas the person kind of this place where I need to, I have to, you know, I have to, I have to do this. It, it, it actually hinders them, um, mm-hmm. which is um, really interesting. Um I know we have a few more minutes left because really interesting because um the digital nomad lifestyle and I actually uh I actually did an experiment that right currently um I you know to be a digital nomad over the summer just to escape the and I realized you know 90 
five percent of my problems come from living in the United States. So, um, but you, <laughs> it's it's quite like here in here in Latin America, people don't have the same. You know, they like everybody is more civil and kind. Europe the same way. And it's just like here, you, you go back to the States, there's this urgency, there's this tension, people yeah. honking and, you know, it's like, but um, what steps do you take to become a digital nomad? What advice would you give someone looking to follow a similar path? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I mean, first and foremost, like you need to have a business that you can run from anywhere in the world. So that is just like, you can't, uh, this is something I've been talking on my social media about too, is like, you can't just go to another country and expect to go into their workforce, um, especially if you don't speak the language. And so you have to be, you have to have a business that you can run. It takes time. That's like the biggest thing is people wildly overestimate how much time they need to build their business because it's also a very much a personal development journey. So you're working through personal stuff uh, as well as trying to build your business, trying to build your niche, your brand, your authority, right? So bring it down a notch <laughs> is first, like have a couple year plan, right? Now this is, there's like a caveat. If you're coming from an industry where you're already been working and you can just become a consultant and you already have connections in that industry, that's a different story. I have a client who was a therapist and she could, she had her own business. And so she took those transferable skills and created a coaching business. And then within 10 months of us working together, she sold everything in the US, she packed up her practice, and she moved down to Mexico because she had her coaching business, right? But she was taking those transferable skills. Now it's very different. Like I was just, I was a waitress at a yacht club in the Cayman Islands, and I was not in the coaching industry, right? So I was starting fresh, fresh. So if you're starting fresh, fresh, then you really need to make sure that you're giving yourself enough time. You want to make sure that you have programs in place, that you have a business model that actually works, um, and that you have consistent reoccurring revenue. Because I've seen clients and people on the internet just freaking out because they didn't have the money coming in, and they can't just go get a job at a coffee shop. They can't just write like, I live in Italy. I can't just go and, I mean, I speak the language a bit better, but like not enough to go get a job somewhere. So my business has to work, right? So don't jump the gun. Don't just like, I know you want out. <laughs> I would want out of the US too. Um, but you really have to be smart about it so that you don't end up panicked in another country trying to figure out how to bring in money. So really having a business model that is tested. Um, and I would also definitely have some savings. I am a huge proponent of profit first to make sure that you have your money put in their buckets um, so that you uh, don't screw yourself over. Yeah, it's quite interesting. It's kind of like you have to have, um, you have to be able to earn an income independent of uh, where you are, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of like, like digital nomads are kind of like the kind of the key definition of freedom you have financial location time how can people find you and follow you and reach out to you and you know find out more about you yeah absolutely so uh shannonwhaley.com um if you go to anti hustle business school.com you can read about the program learn about the program and i'm at the shannon whaley on instagram as well oh and i have a facebook group the anti hustle business coaching not the Anti-Hustle Business Coaching with Shannon Whaley. So, and I do business trainings in there. I do weekly events and that sort of thing. So just search my name and I'm in all the places. Yeah, quite. An, and I really enjoyed the, talking with you. And I know, I know it's evening time for you. So um, end of the day, and I thank you for coming on and for the audience, be sure to check out Shannon's socials, give them a like and follow and, um, and be sure to check out uh, reach out to her if you're interested in becoming a digital nomad or interested in coaching and uh, really interesting. And thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I had a great time. That was really 